John Thomas H. Driver. I was born September the 27th, 1924. And the reason I know that, because at the hospital, that's what you have to tell them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to high school. We didn't pay too much attention to the war, because I guess we were still kids. But I really knew that we were in the war when Dad and mother and and uh, well and Darcy and, and and Hope and I went down to Fort Meade because Uncle Hope was he was a lieutenant then and he was down at Fort Meade and we went down to visit him and when we got there it came over the car radio that Pearl Harbor had been attacked and that's when we knew that we were really in the war but I still had high school to finish because I was 16 then. Guys were going out there, they were going to the movies and, and uh, John Wayne was getting them all geared up and they were joining up and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I said to myself that if I volunteer, I'm wrong because I have to take things as they come and then they work. Because if I volunteer, it goes well. So I waited to be drafted. Typically, see, this is when I first got in, and instead of wearing the pistol like you should, I wore it like a cowboy. <laughs> I was I was 18 then, so you couldn't expect too much. <laughs> we we shipped out of we we would yeah we shipped out of Boston Harbor on my birthday. 20th birthday and it was so full of troops that you took turns you would be down in a hole sleeping then you go on deck with that crew went down and slept in your bunk like that we had been taking 25 mile hikes like twice a week and having no trouble except it was 115 degrees and, and guys were falling out from that and and the funny thing of it was sergeant ron was was the platoon leader because we never seemed to be able to keep a lieutenant. And Sergeant Ron was always the man in charge and he was a master sergeant. He was about six foot four and about 30 inches around the waist. The rest of it was up here. He was, a, and he was, he was like the daddy to the whole platoon. I mean, anything went wrong, you went to Sergeant Ron. The third platoon had this little guy named Austin and he was illiterate. He couldn't even read the name of the street we were on, and it was Austin Street. And every time he went out and got drunk, he was about, I, I think the limit was maybe five foot four or something. And he was just, just tall enough to get in and, and be drafted. And as soon as he'd go out and get drunk, he'd come into our barracks because we would beat Sergeant Ron up. Sergeant Ron was six foot four, and he was five foot four. And Sergeant Ron would grab him by the collar and see the pants, take him down to the shower and turn the cold water on him and hold him under the water. But it was it was kind of a funny ritual. And we were always saying he was 29 years old. My God, he's an old man. Well, of course, we were 19. And he could never make it. Well, generally on one of these 25-mile hikes at 115 degrees, walking down a concrete road, he'd be carrying two or three packs and two or three rifles because the guys fell out. But we always knew that he was going to fall out because he was an old man. But anyhow, so we got over to England after riding on the boat for two weeks and no exercise and go on a nine-mile hike and half the company fell out. They couldn't, you know, it, it, that's how short a time it takes to lose the stamina you built up. We crossed the channel and, and, and uh, went into got into half tracks and moved all the way across France into Belgium. It was the 9th Division or the 9th Armored or somebody was holding holding this line on the Siegfried line. And it was scattered out so wide that you could hardly see the next foxhole because nothing was going to happen there. I mean, it was, it was hilly country and blah, blah, blah. And in the bank of the road, this outfit that was ahead of us had dug a six by six hole. So we go and get any kind of stuff we could and put over top of it and, and, and linoleum and everything else to try to make it waterproof. And five of us slept 
lived in that six by six hole through uh, the whole month of November up until oh, half of December. About six weeks we lived in that hole. Four of us in, inside and one standard guard. The hole was like here, six foot square with the top over it, and it had a cardboard door. And you come out, and then there was a, a, a areaway like this, Doug, where you could stand here, and the machine gun was up here. And behind us, we had built a shelf into the, into the wall, and we had crackers and stuff like that. And this mouse was up there messing around, and I said, I'm going to catch that sucker, and I put a glove on I reached out and put a cracker in my hand and held it like this. And that mouse crawled into my hand. I closed my hand on him, but I couldn't crush that sucker to save my neck because I could just hear his bows crushing. And I held him and held him. So finally what I did is I just threw him back to the snowbank. <laughs> but that shows, you know, <clears throat> one hell of a killer when you can't kill a mouse. In the mornings, you could look and see where the Germans had sent uh, scouting parties right through the line because the line was so spread out. You couldn't, we had a machine, they had a machine gun section up, set up over this big open field. And there was a draw come up down here, there was a house down there, that's where third platoon was. Well, when the bulge hit, they come up that way. And, and the only thing that we saw was a cloudy morning and two of us were standing there watching, and that's when all the artillery and everything was going on. And right out of the fog come five Germans walking right toward us. I grabbed a machine gun, pulled the trigger, and it wouldn't fire because it was froze up. Nobody had told us to cover that damn gun up because the frost would freeze it up. It wouldn't fire. So we just held our breath, and they turned off and what? <laughs> <laughs> the way it didn't keep on coming to it. Because if they'd have come to us, I don't know what we'd have done. Because we had two guys standing there with carbines, you know, because the, the, the main weapons that you had when you had a machine gun section was the machine gun and five guys. So the gunner and assistant gunner carried 45 pistols, which were good for gut shooting, but they weren't, weren't any good, you know. And... The, the ammo bearers, with two ammo bearers, carried carbines, and the squad leader had an M1. And that was, that was the only personal weapons you had. Say, all of it was, was defensive weapons, nothing to, to make an attack with. They come up through the draw, and, and Colonel Butler called artillery in, our own artillery in on them, and all this kind of stuff. But that's the only Germans we saw on on the the uh, 16th of December of the day the bombs hit. They all were the ones coming toward us because they didn't come across the open field that we had covered with the two machine guns. So we had to set up the crossfire. And that's where uh, Sergeant Henderson, the best soldier in the outfit, was hiding down behind the kitchen stove in the farmhouse shooting holes in the ceiling. Ramey, who was, I had a nickname for him that I, that I, I won't uh, reiterate. Anyhow, he was a dumb guy, and he's in a foxhole outside of this building with a BAR, and he killed 21 Germans with that BAR. And he blew his mind, because after he come back, he was, he was sitting there eating peaches off a pine tree in a snowstorm, you know. I mean, he, he, his mind just couldn't handle it. But he, he didn't, <clears throat> he's kept paddling along with us because uh, I don't know why they didn't send him back. I, they didn't know anything about, uh, what do they call it now, post some kind of disorder, what do they call it, where they're treating all these guys? Post-traumatic stress? Yeah, yeah, well, they, they didn't have that kind of trash then. Uh, they had uh, some of the guys out of the First World War, they called it combat fatigue, but they didn't fool with it too much. Anyhow, uh, if, as long as you could still walk and shoot, they didn't care where your mind went. As long as you kept shooting the right, right you know, shooting the right uniform, didn't shoot your own. Anyhow, <laughs> anyhow they, they, we went into, into Riviere's, which wasn't too far out of Liège. Liège was a bigger city. 
but Riviera's was a good sized city. And they spread the, the battalion out all through all the houses with all the people. But they put my squad in an empty house. So we didn't like that too well, so we decided we'd go find our own house. There was four of us anyhow. We, we found this house that an old man, a, a man and his wife and his daughter and his mother lived in. And we would go there every night. And what he did is he worked in Liège and he would buy five bottles of five-star cognac in Liège. We gave him the money. He'd buy one for him and, and one for each one of us. And I think it was the third or the fourth night that I died. And Charlie Kincher gave me artificial respiration two different times because I couldn't breathe. I mean, you drink a fifth of cognac every damn night in about four hours. <laughs> it's a little too much. Gave me artificial respiration. I guess I breathe again. And it, it stopped. I stopped breathing. And finally, I got all right. That was okay. And I don't think it. I, I think the guy kept on bringing us the whiskey. Anyhow, uh, and, and uh, a quartermaster trucker stopped him one time. And he had an 03 rifle. And he leaned against the wall. And he was giving us hell because we weren't treating the people right. I didn't see where we were treating them wrong. You know, I mean, we were eating their groceries and everything, but we were giving them groceries too. Because what did they have? And we'd steal stuff out of the mess, mess tent and stuff and take and give to them, canned goods and stuff. Anyhow, he comes in and gives us all this crap. And I took my 45 pistol and put it in the inside pocket of my eye jacket. You weren't supposed to be armed running around in this town armed because it was behind the lines and all this kind of stuff. And it was Belgium and they were friendly and everything. But I'll be damned if I was going anywhere without a pistol. So I have a pistol in there. And I was about half smashed. So I pulled the pistol out, popped around in. He ran down the street and I ran down after him. And I can't remember whether I fired at him or not. I thought that I did. But then I thought maybe I didn't. But then I was damn lucky I didn't hit him. <laughs> but he took off and left his own three rifles sitting in the house, never come back for it. <laughs> Anyhow, <clears throat> and we left there, and that's when we started started to, on the on the offensive. That's where Milanowski got killed right after that. And we moved so fast that we would move into a town and say, "Okay, we're bed down. This is where we're going to stay." And two hours later, they get us up, and we go to the next town, one right after the other. Uh, I'll tell you the, the one about, about the, the thing there. This German, this German, somebody had shot him. And he had this genuine cowhide, heavy leather dispatch case on his back, on his belt. So I took it off of him and put uh, just personal junk in it. Uh, so anyhow, I had this on my back, and uh, out of sequence a little bit, because we were taking this, taking this, trying to take this town uh, through a bunch of scrub trees that were maybe ten feet high. And what we had done, we had passed uh, an aircraft gun, a German anti-aircraft. I said twenty millimeter because that's what ours was. Theirs, theirs was something in. I don't know what size it was, but it was like 20 millimeter. Anyhow, it was a little exploding shell. And they, Carl and I, Carl Graffunder and I were digging in, and the hill was like uh, a slate. It was a lot of stones. And we didn't get dug in very much. It was raining. It had ponchos on. And they cut loose with this damn gun. And Carl jumped in and hit the hole. I jumped over top of him. I had 21, I think it was 21 holes in my poncho and not a scratch. Of course, some of the holes could have been double where it was flow. And Carl got hit right in the middle of the back. And he says, I can't move my legs. I says, you've never been hit before. So, you know, and uh, so when the shelling stopped, I picked him up and started down the hill with him. And he died on the way down the hill because he it, it had broke his back, the shell had. And I often wonder, even to this day, 
what would have happened if I'd let him alone and let the medics pick him up. But there wasn't any medics around. When that thing was over, you had five men in two, five men in each squad. So that's 10 men plus a, a section sergeant. That's 11 men. And there's three of us left after that barrage. Now, I, I don't know. I know Carl was killed. Uh, several of them were killed, but most of them were just wounds because it was like little razor blades flying. The town down the hill was called Glydorf. And Sergeant Ron said, okay, you keep your squad here, and I'm going down to see if there's any room for us to get into that town yet because the riflemen had already gone in. So Sergeant Ron runs down the hill into the town. All of a sudden, the Germans cut loose with some 88s that were up on the hill on the other side. And they chopped the tree off right above my head. And that's when a piece of shrapnel come down and went through this here and just, just cut my back enough that I could get a Purple Heart out of it. But it was just like somebody hit me in the back with a hammer. And that night, we, uh, and what I did, what I did was I said, come on guys, let's get the hell out of here, because why lay there and, and let the artillery get us? You'd be better off running across the field. So we ran across the field and there was room, we got into the town. Well, Sergeant Rod said I did the right thing. Anyhow, we moved across and went into, uh, it's a, like two story houses in the front and three stories in the back because the hill come down like this. So we're up in the third floor and I says, uh, and, and the Germans counterattacked and I said, well, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do because I can't walk because being hit in the back. So anyhow, what the Germans did, it was, it was like two o'clock in the morning when they hit or one o'clock. And they came in and moved in the first floor, and our guys all moved up on the second and third floor. So long about daybreak, they went down and rooted all the Germans out. And that's when that's when this guy, when we were looking out the window, and hit two Germans go running across the road about 150 yards away. I guess maybe maybe yeah, around 150 yards downhill. And this guy picked up a carbine and threw it up and fired around. And I said, let me have that. And I looked at it and, and the site was totally full of mud. So I cleaned the mud out, drew a bead on the guy's hip and hit him. Bullet went right straight in one side and out the other because the carbine has a high enough velocity that it didn't, it didn't blow his head off. Anyhow, and I was so surprised that I hit him that I let the other one get away. <laughs> Anyhow, I don't really not know. See, after it was all over, we went back down to go through, and there he was laying in the road. So I know I knew that where where I hit him and everything. And I often wonder to this day if that helped end the war or not, because he was just a dumb kid, you know. <laughs> But that's what you think about afterwards. See, see, here, here's a here's the thing that you people don't realize. It's it's a game of attrition. Who kills the most of who? Like playing checkers. Who takes the most checkers? I take your checker. You take my checker, and whoever's got the most left. So that's 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 generally the way you feel about about the war. You know, it's not like you're shooting people. You're shooting checkers off the board. Of course, the checkers shooting back. It was one town right after the other. Never got a chance to rest, and, and then we got to riding on tanks because they're moving so fast across the Cologne Plains. And the, the, the uh, Sherman tanks, some of them were kind of squared and some of them were rounded. Well, the one I rode on was rounded, but it had two things on the side and a big, long crowbar. And I stood on that crowbar and held onto the turret because standing on there, you get off in a hurry because they ain't nothing like a tank to draw fire. I mean, they'd rather shoot a tank than a man anytime, right? So anyhow, this is this is where the one German, mm, no, I missed another German, oh well. Anyhow, the one, the one that the, the forward scout shot with a Tommy gun and he begged me to shoot him and I didn't. I couldn't shoot him because you can't shoot an unarmed man, then it's murder. 
Now, if he'd had a rifle in his hand, I could have shot him, even if he's backwards to me. We could we we could be going across this damn field, and all of a sudden the shells would come in. We'd jump off the tank, lay down on the ground, and go to sleep with the shells falling. That's how we had had no sleep for God knows maybe two weeks, except maybe an hour here and an hour there like that. We're, we're getting ready to take this town, and we come out of this one little town, and I set the machine gun up and I'm firing over top of the of the riflemen going in with their fixed bayonets. And what I was doing was I set in haystacks and barns and stuff on fire with tracer ammunition. And because it was just breaking day, and the little little light in the tower made it easier for them, you know. So anyhow, they they had a King Tiger tank, which I think was a 105 gun on there. It was bigger than the 88 on the on the regular Mark IV. Anyhow, I might even have some of these numbers mixed up, because after all, it's been a few years. And, and uh, <clears throat> so he cuts loose of this damn tank and a shell hit the ground and I went up in the air about 15 feet in the air and come down, hit the ground running and running toward this house. I said, oh, I left my gun. Well, see, this was with enough training. That's where the training comes in. I ran back and got the gun and ran around behind the house. And a woman come running out of the house and it got hit by a shell had a baby in her arm. She looked down, the baby was dead, grabbed it by the leg, threw it out across the orchard to kept on. That's how scared she was. <laughs> and what was the story on the bridge at Remagen? Oh my God, I forgot the bridge at Remagen, didn't I? That's one of the big biggies. Wow. We made a movie about it. <laughs> how did I forget the bridge at Remagen? Yeah, we even visited that in 88, remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went back over there in 88 and they had made a monument for the 99th Division mm -hmm. out of one of the 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 big buttments on the bridge. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you ever saw the movie or not of the uh, bridge at Ramayan, but it was a bridge almost exactly like the Ludendorff Bridge, but it was in Czechoslovakia that they used in the movie. And it almost looked like it. It did. And we, we went into this town, I can't remember the name of the town. See, the Ludendorff Bridge was named after General Ludendorff, the German general in the First World War. And he had that bridge built and a tunnel through to carry supplies. And it wasn't very much used after that, but I think it probably was. Uh, so we come in and they're throwing every damn thing they can think of at that bridge. I mean, this is where I first saw a jet airplane, the German jet plane. And here goes our P-38 going, and here goes the German, zoom. <laughs> I mean, it was, I guess about the fourth day after the bridge was taken, fourth or fifth day. It was two or three days before it fell down. Anyhow, they were dropping everything on that bridge, trying to knock it down so we couldn't cross it. So we're standing back there, and then Sergeant Rod says, okay, let's go. Take off and run across that damn bridge, and six for six are flying through the air, landing in the water, and, and uh, you get across the other side, and there, we had very little bit of a, 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 a ground on the other side, and it was a stone quarry. And we're going up this hill to the stone quarry, and there's a tank up there, and we had a tank down here. And it was a funny thing to watch, two monsters. This tank would make a jump, and this tank would make a jump. But it was one of the old German tanks who didn't have a swivel turret. The turret would go up and down, but he had to move the tank. Well, our, our cheesy little um, Zippo lighter uh, Sherman tank, it had a movable turret. So what he did, the German made a jump and fired and missed our tank, and our tank fired and hit him. And it was really interesting to lay here and watch these two tanks shooting over your head. <laughs> There's another, another one. We're taking this damn town uh, uh, in the Royal Pocket, and we're going across like this, and we're spread out. We're going across, and it's a little knoll like this. And the town is about, a, oh, hell, it looked like a mile to me, but I don't know. And we're laying here on top of the hill. So in order to take the town, they decided to bring tanks up and fire on the town. They brought the tanks up and set them behind us. And they're shooting 
right over top of our head. And when you'd look back like this, like that, you could see the shell. And there you are laying about, oh, a uh, hundred yards in front of these tanks and the damn thing shooting that far over top of your head. That is scary. <laughs> Cause that take a boom, boom like that, you know, now how do you know it's going to settle enough <laughs> or settle too much to where they, they were firing so fast. I know they couldn't aim each time. Well, that was pretty scary. But they didn't hit us. The next really thing that I do remember, see, because I had I had a staff sergeant. Now I'm a PFC because they didn't bother that that toward the end of the war they didn't bother to give you rank or anything. They just gave you the, the squad to run. So I was a PFC squad leader. He was a staff sergeant out of a trucking outfit, and he's a guy that said if the bullet's got your name on it, it's going to get you. And he was the first one to dig the deepest hole. But the shells were coming in. I don't remember where it was. But anyhow, he didn't get these holes fast enough. And he got a, a small piece of shrapnel with one jaw and out the other. And they called that a million dollar wound because he got the chance to go back. He did. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow uh, so we, we, we're, we're going to go, go across the Danube River. And we had the stupidest man in the world, one of the stupidest men in the world, was our company commander. And his name was Smith. Uh, we had had him as a platoon leader for a while. And and uh, he, he's the same guy that said, uh, uh, take your squad to chow uh, after a while because we've got too many people going. But where's the chow like? He says, two fingers left of the moon. Well, the damn moon moved. <laughs> so I had to lead these guys across a minefield and I don't know why I felt that, that I could do it because I figured that if I walked and watched my step, I, I wouldn't step on a mine because the ground was didn't look like it had been broke up. So anyhow, I let them cross, cross which was no heroic thing because I didn't, didn't think it was anything, you know. Anyhow, so uh, they're, they're trying to cross the Danube River and they're using these little flat bottom assault boats, which all, I don't know, I can't remember the number of men, whether seven or 14 or something like that. But as soon as they get out in the middle of the river, the Germans will blow the damn boat out of the river. So Captain Smith is bringing, he, he had to pull out and he's coming back with his whole damn company riding in one Jeep. He had about 12 men piled on his Jeep out of what, a hundred and oh, just a little under 200 men and he called back to, to uh, old stupid uh, General Lahr and said, what should I do? He said, keep moving forward and use all weapons. How the hell are you gonna use all the weapons out of a flat bottom boat, you know? So anyhow, uh, we waited and they kept on playing around and we were in reserve. So then they decided we're going to go up the river about two miles and cross. We went up and crossed the river, no, no opposition. And we're coming down the other side and I had I think I had two men, me and two men was always in my squad at that time. And the German machine gun opened up on us. Well, German machine guns, it was, it was just getting dark. German machine guns, their tracer ammunition was white and ours was red. So here comes these tracers coming in. So I grabbed, I hollered, come on, let's set the gun up here and fire on it. And I turned around and this guy had just come overseas and he turned around, he was running. And I turned around fast enough, grabbed him by the ankle, and pulled him back to make him, as my sister gun, I had to have somebody load that gun. So he loaded the gun, I opened up on, on the machine gun, and I don't know whatever happened, because he didn't fire back at us anymore. But this is where your discipline comes in, and your training, see? See, like I said, I turned around and ran back and got my gun. I never thought about anything else. This guy, bullets coming in, run. But see, the thing of it is, the safest thing is to run to the enemy. Don't run from him because he can shoot you to the back. But you run to him, you might be able to overpower him. So with the training, you run to the enemy. Without the training, you run from him. So uh, that, that right after that is when they said the war ended. We had just crossed the Danube River. And at, at what, May the 5th or something like that it was. And that's when the war ended. And what you felt was 
I don't realize what you felt. Your whole, your whole being was centered on, on this, and it's all gone. So it was just a big void when the war was over. What do we do next? So anyhow, uh, there's probably a lot of things in there I, I, I don't or, or would remember at another time. I probably have told them before, but I think that's about the highlight. Nobody is a hero because they intend to be. Uh, being a hero is something that, that it just kind of falls on a guy like, like uh, uh, Audie Murphy and, and uh, uh, what's your name, Sergeant York and those. They just did what they had to do at the time and it was heroics because they didn't think of themselves, they thought of the objective that they had to accomplish. And that's what made the hero. Not, not the guy that says, well, I'm going out and be a hero. Well, only, no such a thing. Because self-preservation, natural self-preservation doesn't let you do stupid stuff unless it has, unless the, the consequence is outweighs the danger of it. And that's the hero.